And I'd just like to add, if folks want to do more research to really get a good handle on this, then one of the best resources out there is the farming systems trial that's been done at the Rodale Institute now for, I believe, about 35 years running, where there's been side-by-side -side conventional or organic um, crops that have been maintained for 35 years. It's been done in parallel. And it's just astounding to look at the results. You can see the research summary, or you can go into more depth and actually look at what's happened there. And, and part and parcel of that, in terms of trying to understand how we make sure that we're moving forward in, in positive ways with organic agriculture, only 0.01% of research acres in the United States is dedicated to organic production. 0.01%, and that's it. I'd like to challenge the, you know, us to find a way, to have one land grant institution in this country find a way to replicate some of these studies and to further advance the research that's needed in terms of organic agriculture instead of the other uh, percent, uh, which is just totally overwhelming, the, the fact that all the rest of the research is being dedicated to conventional agriculture. I, uh, I know some very smart people, and I've said to them, you know, there's a lot of information on GMOs and pesticides and the modern food system that's very uh, clear that this is very problematic and there's health issues and environmental issues. Um, and I would be very, and I'm concerned about it, and maybe you should consider not eating pesticide, foods with pesticides and GMOs. And they've said to me very clearly, um, no, there's no scientific proof. So if, is there, scientific proof and how much of it that GMOs and pesticides are bad for us. What, what is the proof? Why, why are you all so convinced that this proof, what is the proof? What's the proof? How much proof is there? I mean, how, what, what do we say when people say there's no proof? First, I th there is proof, but, but a very important point is the burden of proof is not supposed to be on the people who have concerns anyway. The burden of proof by law in the United States and the European Union, which are both supposed to be upholding the precautionary principle when it comes to food safety. By the way, people usually don't know that about the US. Our US food safety law since 1958 has strongly instituted the precautionary principle, more strongly actually than has the European Union. So if the, according to the precautionary principle and according to all sound policy, the people that are introducing new uh, technologies that many scientists recognize as having the uh, potential to cause great harm, and when there is not scientific evidence of safety, the burden of proof is supposed to be on the people introducing the new technology or the new additives. And that burden has been shifted in the case of GMOs uh, and was shifted very early on in the genetic engineering venture, even well before genetic engineering was even able to move into agriculture. It's been very, it was very difficult to move from genetically engineering bacteria to creating a genetically engineered plant. The proponents would have you believe it was very simple. It wasn't. Several barriers had to be broken. Genome, uh, DNA had to be rewritten. Genes had to actually be rewritten before bacterial genes could function within uh, the cells of plants. Many other changes had to happen as well. So the burden of proof was surreptitiously shifted and illegally shifted, and it has remained shifted, and people don't even understand that. So first, we shouldn't, we meaning anybody with concerns, the burden shouldn't be on us to prove that these foods are unsafe. The burden should be on the manufacturers to demonstrate they're safe, and that burden has never been met. But secondly, to the extent the research, solid research has been done, and especially research by independent scientists, and by that I mean scientists that are independent of the financial or other influence of the corporations that are making the foods, or independent of the drive to prove these foods are safe no matter what, the good research has raised not only several doubts, but demonstrated that a number of genetically engineered foods have caused serious harm to the laboratory animals that were unfortunate enough to end up in the experimental groups rather than the control groups in the experiments. 
they ate the GMOs, they, they got sick. Their livers and or their kidneys were, were harmed or their pancreases or their pituitary glands or they got gas, severe gastric inflammation. There are many, many different harms that have been documented. So these claims, and they, you will read claims by the UK Royal Society, by the United States National Academy of Science, that there's no evidence of any harm ever coming from a single genetically engineered food. That's just false. It is a misstatement of the scientific record. There are many studies in the peer-reviewed scientific literature that have documented significant harm to the unfortunate animals that were put in the experimental group. And unfortunately, the population of the US, Canada, Argentina, and many other countries has been put in, and I won't say the experimental group, because it's not even an experiment. There's no epidemiological data being, uh, being gathered. So people could be getting sick now from GMOs, through cancer, through Crohn's disease, from many other common ailments, and we would not know it, and we probably could never know it because of the shoddy way that the uh, shoddy lack of follow-up. So when people say, well, there's an experiment going on on the population, no, it's not an experiment. <laughs> it's just imposition of high-risk foods, but it's not an experiment because nobody's going to learn anything from it the way they're going. There has been plenty of evidence showing that GMOs and pesticides are harmful. I have a peer-reviewed published article that you can review at Non-GMO Improves Health and it has 200 citations, and it talks about a lot of the research that Stephen just talked about. And if you go to Non-GMO Improves Health, there's also a free copy of my book, Genetic Roulette, which at 2007 was the full compilation of all the health risks from GMOs, and there's a video of some updates of some of the problems that they've discovered since then. So that's available in case someone says, there's no evidence. You can go there, and there's the evidence. Could you just repeat that again, where the evidence is? It's non-gmoimproveshealth.com. And you can, again, get the, the free book, the free update, an interview with a doctor who just sees what's happening with the children, plus a summary of the peer-reviewed article and the full 26-page article with all the citations. You know, thanks, Jeff. You know that um, when they studied Roundup, so supposedly studied it, they didn't study it. When they approved of Roundup, the testing was done only on glyphosate, the, one of the ingredients, supposedly the active ingredient but it's not the only active ingredient. But that, was what they, but that was what they did all the testing on. So now it turns out, just in the past year or two, that R Roundup also contains POEAs, or surfactants, that allow the penetration of chemicals into past the uh, plant coatings and into the plant itself. And the same thing in human beings. It, violates different biological pathways in our bodies. And it also contains, thanks to Seralini's research, arsenic. And what, how did that happen? How come Monsanto didn't inform the FDA of that? And how come the FDA didn't question it or do their own study on it? So to piggyback on what Philip was saying and everybody else as well, the precautionary principle is imperative that we have to fight to make sure that before chemicals are introduced into our environment, that they're proven safe first, not afterwards when they see, oh, how many people died from this or that. I know in uh, 2000, in 1999, New York City, under Mayor Giuliani, began spraying a mal uh, malathion, which is an organophosphate, all over, all over the city from the air. I was in Prospect Park. The helicopters came. They sprayed the entire park. And little kids out there, everybody was getting drenched in this stuff. 
We are running around trying to get kids out of the park as quickly as we can. And where was the study beforehand to say that you can spray this on little kids, let alone everybody else? None. And they, they went ahead and did that anyway. So I do think that morality is a really important issue here in addition to the economic factors and the political factors that we've been talking about. The morality of it needs to be first and foremost as well. And I think people here are very moral and we're here and concerned and we're gonna not let this happen anymore, right? Jim. Can I just say one thing? I just want to just speak on the, the, the spraying of the malathion. That was for the, the West Nile virus. And that is now used as a classic example of if you want to spread a disease and make sure that you spread it far and wide, what Giuliani did then in New York City did was the perfect way because now West Nile virus is all over the U.S., because all the malathion did is disperse the mosquitoes and made sure they left New York City to go to greener pastures. And I think that's actually one of the other things I just want to say here, one of the mythologies about pesticides. When DDT was invented, the inventor of DDT got the Nobel Prize because what, what would in those days, you used to lose about 8% of crops to pesticide, uh, to um, insect damage. And this would increase food security by 8%. So they gave him the Nobel Prize for that. Now, it's close to 21% loss, between 16 and 21% loss with pesticides. This mythology that pesticides stop pests is wrong. It's the other way around. It's the same would round up ready crops are going to stop weeds. Now there are super weeds because of resistance. And that is the other issue with these things. It is not the solution that they make it out to be. It's turned out to be exactly the opposite. 